and it will be done in a way that uh, will glorify the Lord. Uh, I told you before and I will say it again. You practice so that you know what you're going to do when you are actually doing it. Amen. Uh, because, uh, you know, we are happy people. Uh, we should be because we are the children of God. But there are things in every time there is a season. Amen? Amen. There is a time to laugh. There is a time to, you know, tease or joke with each other. But there are times that we need to be serious because you are preparing the hearts of the people to listen to the word of God. And uh, if we're not doing that, so let's get rid of our spatial number. Let's just go on to the preaching of God's word. And also those that are manning the, uh, what do you call this, communication or whatever you call that, you practice first. Because, you see, they, they will be needing a microscope to read what was flashed on the screen. We have to be, uh, you know, practice our common sense regarding this. Amen? I have to say this because uh, it should not happen. It happened before, I told you, and then it happens again. So, when are we going to stop doing this? So those that are in the music ministry, maybe uh, please uh, be uh, serious with uh, your ministry and do what you should do so that while you're doing it, it's going to be done in a way, not to impress people. We, we are not impressing people, but we are trying to please God. Amen? So that is what we're going to do. So sometimes, uh, if, if, if we're not reminded, we might go overboard. And that's not a good thing. So we have to always uh, be reminded about these things so that we know how to act and behave ourselves in the house of the Lord, especially when we are doing the ministry. Amen? Okay, the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, after I say that, some of you will be suffering and I will be preaching about suffering today. So there may be, that's uh, one reason. So that we can, in that way you have prepared the message. But not in the way that you sang the uh, special number. Shall we stand up and we will pray before we go to the uh, passage. Because we have already read it. Father in heaven, we are thankful for once again giving us this wonderful time. Not only to have listened to your word in our Sunday school, but to once again listen to your word in our preaching service. Lord, we thank you because you are a faithful God. You are so loving, so kind. You're doing things, oh God, to help us grow in our faith because only a growing and matured faith will help us make it through in this world. A world filled with evil and sufferings, a darkened world controlled by Satan, the God of this world, whose end will come once you establish your kingdom, O God. But we thank you that even in this evil time, there are things, Lord, that we can do in order to win battles, to have victories, Lord, over these things. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to enlighten us with your word, that we may know what to do whenever things that our mind can't seem to fathom may happen to us. So that, Lord, we will not be taken aback and make decisions that will ruin our testimony because we do not have enough knowledge regarding the ministry of suffering. I pray, O oh God, that you will help us understand that as a Christian, nothing is accident, O oh Lord. It is always according to your plan. And if we know your plan, then we can act accordingly and respond in a proper way. So thank you, Lord, for continually enlightening us with your word and continue to add to the 
knowledge, O God, and give us a grace so that we will be humble as we learn more things from Thee. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins and even the times that when we fail, when we're serving You, we thank You, Lord, because You are always giving us another chance so that we can do better. Help me, Lord, as I preach and help your people as they listen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we have read our text today, and that was in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 8. Now, our study will focus on verses 6 to 8, but I'm just going to give you a very uh, short background of uh, the first uh, five verses that we have read. In verse number one, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So we can see here that the author of this epistle is Peter. He is the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one who denied the Lord. He was the one who is uh, hot-headed. He is the one who is always uh, uh, going his way instead of obeying the Lord. His life is filled with ups and downs, but mostly down before he was converted. So even in the life of, the, of uh, Peter, we can see that our God is a God of a second chance. Our God is a God who is working things so that it will work for our good, as was mentioned a while ago, that if we are called according to the purpose of God, and if we love God, then God will see to it that we can navigate all through the... Uh, trials, testings, temptations, even sins in life, so that we can come out of all of these things better than before, and that we can minister and serve God and glorify His name. Amen. So we can see that Peter is an example of that. And then Peter addressed this epistle to the strangers scattered throughout many different places. So, primarily, uh, Peter is talking to the uh, Christians that are a, that have a Jewish background. He's talking to uh, those Jewish people who converted to Christianity. Uh, let us not forget that Peter is the apostle to the circumcision, while the apostle Paul is the apostle to the uncircumcision. So he said that these people are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You see, election is, is not a problem as long as we always equate the foreknowledge of God. God has the power to elect. Why? Because God knows everything. In our limited mind, we cannot seem to understand this because we do not know what will happen even one second from now. But to God, from everlasting to everlasting is already known by God. He knew the people who will accept Him when they were presented the Word of God. He knew the people who will repent of their sins and open their hearts and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So because of that, because of the foreknowledge of God, He can do the electing. Unlike what uh, Calvin, Calvinists believe that uh, God elected people just according to His desire, just according to His wish, and then uh, there are some people left out that will have to go to hell. Because they were simply not elected by God. And there are people who will go to heaven simply because they were elected by God. You see, the solution to this problem is that we are elected. Why? Because God knew that we are part of the whosoever who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So these are the people that Peter are writing to. And then he said that we were saved because of the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we need to be obedient in order to go through the process of sanctification. And then in verse number 3, that we are begotten into a lively hope by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why for a Christian, we should not uh, stay in a state of sadness or misery. Why? Because we have a lively hope. Amen. No matter what is happening in our lives, one day will come that we will leave this world and all its misery and we will be with the Lord forever with all the bliss and the joy that God will give unto us. Amen. Amen. So it doesn't matter what our lives will be. It doesn't matter what we are experiencing 
in this world. What matters is the end of our journey and we will end up in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our lively hope. And what is the basis of that hope? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he died, but he rose again. So those who believe in Jesus, though we will die, but we will rise again. Amen? We are going to be with Jesus no matter what happened. Because Jesus has the power. And then we will go to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. So that is why there is already a reservation. We are already booked up in heaven and our booking goes with it all the amenities that the blessing of God will give us. So that is why we are being encouraged as Christians not to really work for the things that are only temporal. But we need to work for the things that are eternal. The Bible says those things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And as a Christian, we must work for the meat that perisheth not. Instead of those things that will last only for our lifetime. That is why we have to be wise. That is why we need to know the will of God. That is why we need to obey the will of God. Because only the will of God will have uh, what we call uh, value even after this life. So we are wasting our time if all we are shooting for are the things that can give us joy in this material world. So we need to understand that we already have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and faded not away. You see, uh, what we will receive from the Lord will always be fresh. It will not fade. It will not be corrupted. It will always be there. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's why we have assurance of salvation. Why? Because we are being kept by God. You see, the fault of so many religions today and so many pulpit today is that they are trying to preach that we can keep our salvation. No, we cannot. Nobody can keep his own his salvation, but only God can keep our salvation. Because only God has the power to thwart everything that the devil is planning in order to steal from us the gift that was given to us by God and that is salvation. The Bible says we are kept by the power of God. Amen. And if we are being kept by the power of God, there is none more powerful than God. So we are safe. We are secured in the hands of the Lord. So everything is still positive. Everything is okay. Everything is about, you know, the promises of God, about eternity past, going to eternity future. It is about His promise that we are going to be with Him, that we have inheritance already in heaven, that everything is going to be fine. But when He went to verses 6 to 8, there is something that we need to go through before experiencing all of these things in our lives. And that is something that we call one of life's greatest mysteries. One that is very hard to understand. And that is what we call suffering. And not only that, but even the presence of so much suffering in this world, especially in the lives of God's children, it presents what we call a great moral and ethical problems. Because if there is a God, why all this evil? If God is powerful, why all these things, why bad things are happening even to good people if God is a powerful God? So it presents a, a great moral and ethical problem and people will even say that God is simply uh, not interested in what is happening in this world. Why? Because it seems that God is not doing anything even though bad things are happening 
to his very own people. So why are these things being allowed by God if God <coughs> really exists? So listen, even to the Christian, there is a strong element of mystery in the question of suffering. But listen, if you are an enlightened child of God, you are going to view this not as a mystery, but as a ministry. Amen. Not a mystery, but something that you cannot understand, but a ministry that you can use and that God can use in order for us to be a blessing to other people. So the Christian comes to see that God, who is over all, in control of everything, and guiding our lives, the lives of all his children has a gracious and wonderful purpose in permitting them to suffer. So why do we suffer? What are the reasons why we experience sufferings in our lives? So this is what we are going to study today. And Peter has so many things to say regarding suffering. Number one, in the life of every Christian, there are periods and experiences of suffering and trial. In the lives of every Christian, there are periods of and experiences of suffering and trial. You see, your personal experience will con confirm this. All of us experience suffering. Amen. All of us experience trials and temptations in life. Look at verses 6 and 7. And there are two things that we need, two words that we need to understand. Heaviness in verse number 6. And then in verse number 7, trials. That the trial of your faith. And then in verse number 6, that is what we call heaviness. So listen, the child of God shares the sufferings and trials common to mankind. There is no immunity to suffering because we are Christians. Amen. Uh, you, you cannot say, uh, I think I, I should be uh, immune from suffering because I'm a child of God. So how will a child of God suffer if his father is the most powerful being in the world? Why will I suffer if my father is the wealthiest person in the world? Why will I suffer if my father is the almighty God? It should be always a well in my life. It should be joy and happiness. Everything should work fine. Why? Because I am a child of God. No. You are not excused. We are not excused from suffering because we are a child of God. God has a purpose. Amen? Amen. Why he allow sufferings in life? Look at Job chapter 5 verse number 7. Job chapter 5 and verse number 7. The Bible says, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. So you can see, if you are going to look back in your life, you will see trouble after trouble after trouble so many times in our lives. Why? Because that is the nature of this world. That is the nature of the beast. We are living in a world that is controlled by Satan since Adam and Eve succumbed to the temptation at the Garden of Eden. We were given a sinful nature and it is natural for us to commit sin. We have a natural propensity to commit sin and sin has consequences. Therefore, there is suffering. When God created the heaven and the earth, when God put man in the Garden of Eden, there were no cemeteries. Because it was not God's plan for man to die. That's because of sin. We need to have cemeteries. Because of sin, we need to have jails. Because of sin, we need to have hospitals. Because of sin, we need to have rehabilitation center and all of these things. Why? Because of the sinful nature that we have. Therefore, suffering goes hand in hand with our being a sinful people. Even though we are saved, we still have the old nature. And even though we are Christians, we will still commit sin. And if there is a sin, there is the chastisement from God. And every chastisement is a suffering. Amen. You experience that. Pag pinapalo ako, suffering yun. 
Pag namamalo ang magulang, suffering yun. Because no parents will enjoy disciplining his children. Whenever I discipline my three children, whenever I spank them, I'm the one who's getting hurt. But I have to do it. Why? Because if I'm not going to do it, foolishness will not be driven out of their hearts. And they will not grow up to be the kind of children that God wants them to be. So we have to experience all of these things and it was given unto us. Look at chapter 14 verse 1 of the same book. The Bible says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. You see, that is the proclamation of the word of God. Our lives will be filled with trouble. Even though we will live in this world for just few years, those years are filled with trouble. So, do not even think that because you are now a child of God, then you are immune from suffering. Not only that, because we are Christians, then we need to experience sufferings. Again, even if, if you are a child of God, you are not excused from suffering. Because you are a child of God, you must suffer. Look at these uh, verses in the Bible. Matthew chapter 10, verse 25. It is part of Christian life. Suffering is a part of Christian life. It is not enough for the disciples that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? You see, our Lord, our master experienced suffering. He was ridiculed. And the Bible says, no servant is greater than his master. If he suffered, then we will also suffer. Why? Because we follow him. And we are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of our learning is what we call suffering. Look at John 15, 18 to 19. John 15, 18 to 19. Herein is my Father glorified. If the world hates you, ye know it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, you question yourself if the world loves you. You question your salvation if you are accepted by the world. Because the Bible is very clear that we are not of the world. We are chosen out of the world and because we are not one with this world, then the world will definitely hate us. Why? Because we speak a different language. We serve a different master. We have a different goal. We live a different life. It is like we are aliens to this world Therefore, if we love God, then the world will hate us. You cannot enjoy both words. It is either you are for the Lord or you are for the world. Love not what? The world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? All the things in this world are temporal and they will be burned with fire. But the things of God will remain forever. Amen? So that is the reason why there is going to be suffering. Because we are different. Don't you know uh, those people who are different are, are the people that are being bullied? It is like we are being bullied by the world. Because we do not live the same life as they have. For them, we are weird. Because our joy is in this book. Our joy is in fellowshipping with each other. Our joy is in worshiping God. And the world does not like that. Since you got saved, and the Lord changed your life, go back to your friends, you will not be accepted. When I got saved, I experienced that. Whenever I go to them, they 
have all the excuses in the world not to talk to me not to be with me why because i share to them the word of god and for them that is something that is not cool something that is not acceptable what they want are something that will make them happy in the flesh look at john 16 33 16 33 look at what the bible says these things i have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation tribulation is a very strong word it is not just suffering but it is of the highest degree of suffering but be of good cheer i have overcome the word so a christian listen to me again a christian who is living the christian life is not going to have peace in this world but only in the lord that is why a christian who really loves god will always pray and will always be present for this kind of gathering why because it is the only time that he can be with the people of the same mind Amen. that he will be exposed to the things of god it is very hard to live out there the words that you are hearing the things that we are saying that the, the environment that we are in all are not conducive to a life of holiness but praise god when we are gathering together then we can speak the same thing because we have of the same mind we have the same spirit and we can worship the same god so we can be joyful in god and we can have peace in the lord and that is very hard to find in the world why look at philippians 1 29 this is our calling that's why whether we like it or not this is what will happen to us for unto you it is given in the behalf of christ not only to believe amen, amen. not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake because you are a christian you will suffer i have a classmate in bible college he says that you know brother joel i haven't experienced suffering yet in my life since i got saved i said well sister it's not a matter of if it is just a matter of when and you have to be careful and you have to be ready because suffering may come anytime and then all of a sudden suffering came to her and she almost quit bible school but only by the grace of god she was able to continue and now she is a pastor's wife serving the lord so suffering is a part of our christian life kaya kapatid pag nahihirapan ka wag kang pariklariklamo magpasalamat ka kasi nararanasan mo yung pagiging kristyano because if all you want is joy in this world then that is wishful thinking it is something that will never happen because god has given us not only that we believe in him but also to suffer why for the sake of the lord jesus christ amen not for our sake alone so these are things that we are going to experience first peter 4 12 to 13 first peter 4 12 to 13 beloved think it not strange concerning the fiery trial wow nag-aapoy naglalagablab na pagsubok the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you you see as a christian we should not utter this phrase lord why me what do you want others god is dealing with you and god has his own dealing with other people but the bible says think it not strange it is common that we are going to experience fiery trial and when we experience that we need to be ready because we know it is coming it is just a matter of time oh you see uh, if i'm going to go back in my life there are some episodes that i really would like to forget 
There is the episode where I can see Sister Maribel almost dying because of pain in her heart. Not, not physical pain, but emotional pain. And I said to myself during that time, Lord, why are we experiencing these things? But that is part of our life. That is part of being a Christian. That is part of the ministry that God is giving us. You see, we want to minister to the Lord. And when we want to minister to the Lord, sometimes we can choose. We can say, I will minister in the music ministry and be a part of the choir. I will join the outreach and be part of ministering to the uh, Cambodian people in, uh, in, in, in the villages of Cambodia. Then I will uh, minister in, uh, you know, doing uh, the, the things on, on the booth and all of these things. But ladies and gentlemen, nobody chooses the ministry of suffering. And yet, all of us will go through the ministry of suffering. Whether you like it or not. Because it was given to us. Look at verse number 13. But rejoice, my. This is the mystery. How can you rejoice in the midst of suffering? That's why they say that, they say that Christians are cuckoo. Because how can you rejoice when you are suffering? The normal thing to experience when you're suffering is to be sad, sometimes to be furious, sometimes to, to always be negative, because how can you rejoice when you're aching, when there is pain, when you're hurting? How can you rejoice when you are seeing all of these things in this world happening right before our very eyes as if our God is not doing anything? How can we rejoice? But God commanded us to rejoice. Why? Because it is the will of God. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. So no matter how hard it is, rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So when we are suffering, listen, and we are rejoicing, and we are accepting it, we are being like Christ in this area of suffering that when his glory shall appear uh, uh, shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy masasabi mong salamat naranasan ko ang naranasan ng Panginoon kaya yung joy ng Panginoon ay nararanasan ko rin ngayon and there is no joy greater than the joy of the Lord amen you see in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ if there was no crown of thorn, then there will be no crown of joy. If there was no death, then there will be no life. If there was no tomb, then there was be no resurrection. If Jesus did not suffer, then we're not going to experience bliss. But he uh, goes through, he went through all of these things. Why? In order for us to experience something that we cannot experience except for the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will be filled with suffering. So be prepared. Prepared for that. And if we are not suffering enough, listen, we are not living enough for the Lord, Jesus Christ. But no matter what happened, look at Psalms chapter 34, verse 19. Psalms 34, 19. I like this verse. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many. Not few. But many are the affliction of the righteous. But this is what I like. But the Lord delivered him out of them all. Amen. Amen. All. It means to say that no suffering will happen that we cannot overcome as long as we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding. Even all our ways, we will acknowledge him then. He can direct our path. Amen? And we are going to be victorious in spite of all of these sufferings. So in our lives, there are periods of suffering and trial. There are experiences of suffering and trial. Number two, these periods of suffering and trial are intermittent. 
these periods of suffering and trials are intermittent. Look at verse number 6. Let's go back to verse number 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. You take note of that. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So, the Bible says that our suffering is not one continuous event. There will be times of rest from suffering. There will be times of refreshing. Thank God because He did not allow us to experience suffering all at once with all the evil and the heaviness of that suffering. Because if that will happen, then we'll not be able to bear it. But God knew our frame. God knows what we can handle. And He will give us a measure of suffering from time to time. So that we will be able to bear it by the grace of God. So at present, we are temporarily harassed. Meaning to say, whatever suffering you are experiencing now, listen, it will end sooner or later. But it will happen again. And then it will end again and so on and so forth until we see the Lord Jesus Christ in His glory when there will be no more suffering. Amen? That's why we will experience heaven more. Because in heaven, we're not going to experience all of these things. But here on earth, we need to be ready because these things will always happen. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 17. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17. For our, what? Light. Ano yung light? Di maliwanag ha? Magaan. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Tignan mo, light na, for a moment pa. Pero yung iba gusto magpakamatay. Yung iba gusto magbackslide. Iba gustong sumuko na. Iba sabi, Lord, bakit nangyayari sa akin to? Napakabigat, hindi ko kaya. Kapatid, God will not give you anything that you cannot bear. Why? Because our God is a gracious God. Amen. When God gave it to you, then have faith that you can bear it. Kaya nga sabi niya, light. Ano sabi niya sa isang part, sa Matthew? Ano rin yung kanyang burden? Easy. Light na, easy pa. Kita nyo gano'n kabait ang Diyos. Yung suffering na binigay sa'yo, yung trials na binigay sa atin, light and easy. Pastor, there is nothing light with losing a loved one. There is nothing light and easy with that. Who told you? When they die, their suffering will end and they will be in heaven. And they're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. No more problem, no more pain, no more suffering, no more uh, ache, no more hurting, no more night. Everything will be fine. How can that be heavy? Do you know why it is heavy? Because we are so selfish. That we do not want to let go because we can get something out from them. Because they can comfort us. Because they can give us this and that. Because they can be in our presence. And, and their presence will be a great help to us. So all we're thinking is ourselves. That's why we make things heavy when God has given us light affliction. Pinabibigat natin. Wala na akong tatay. Paano na yan? Oh, di ba? Wala na akong asawa. Paano na yan? Paano ako magsusurvive? Abi kung paano ako nag-survive nung wala ka pang asawa? Wala na akong anak, paano ako magsusurvive? Nung ipinangana ka ba, may anak ka na? E ba't nag-survive ka? We can always survive. Why? Because the affliction that God will allow to happen to us is something that is light. And look at the result, which is but for a moment. Light for a moment, but look at the, uh, look at the purpose. It is work 
working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, God has given us light affliction in order to give us an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It is like investing a few dollars and then receiving thousands of dollars in return. That is what God is trading for the affliction that He is giving us today. And yet we despise our trials. And yet we, dis we despise our sufferings. And then we question God. I remember Sister Chuchi when his uh, husband died. We went to their house and she was crying and she said, Brother Joel, why my husband? I told her, sister, accept it. It is the will of God. Who do you want to die? Me? Or other people? That is God's plan. You have to accept what God has given you because you, there is nothing good will result in not letting go and letting God. You can hold mightily, tightly onto something. When God has taken it away from you, you cannot do anything. Just let it go and you will have the peace of God. Accept it. Why? Because it is something that God is allowing us to go through. Because ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not, somebody will die in, 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 in the circle of our family. Whether you like it or not. Or whether you like it or not, you may be the one who will die in the circle of that family. It is either you will lose your loved ones or your loved ones will lose you. But how can we gain from this? Let us look at the goodness of God and the things that we have gained in that relationship with these people instead of looking at the loss that we have. That's why, as a Christian, we really do not say, sorry for your loss. Because any loss that we may think is always again in heaven. And that will work a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory for the light affliction that God is allowing us to experience in our lives. Number three, these periods of suffering and trials are with a purpose. These periods of sufferings and trials are with a purpose. For the child of God, there is a ministry in suffering. This proving of our faith is planned by God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 6. That, that, uh, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation again. Suffering is not by chance. It is something designed by God so that God can work in our lives. Are you familiar with military training? Amen? Amen. Some people, if they will look at military training, if they're not interested in, 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 in war, in military, and all of these things, we look at the training and say, that's ridiculous. Why do they have to go through that? Why do... It, at, at PMA, when you eat, you, you need to maintain a straight posture, and then you're not look, actually looking at what you're eating, but you have to be, to be uh, alert while you're eating, because in times of war, it can help save your life. And then they have to wake up early in the morning. That's the reason why, actually, when I graduated from high school, I took the exam uh, for PMA, Philippine Military Academy. And then I was actually accepted. But when I try to look at what will happen in Baguio City, if I will enter PMA, you will wake up early in the morning, you will jog, and they will make a fool of you, and all of this training, because I really could not understand how will it help me, and why do I have to go through these things in life? Because I'm not interested. Actually, it, it was the, uh, the prodding of my mother why I took the exam. Actually, uh, I, I took the exam together with uh, my very unfortunate cousin, General uh, Albayalde, because he's now facing a lot of problems in, in the Philippines right now. But, but he was once the uh, chief of a uh, uh, PNP, one of the highest ranking uh, 
uh, police in the Philippines. I told him, if I push through with the PMA, you will not be the chief of police. I'm not saying me, because I will, uh, I will uh, uh, distract him and make him quit the PMA. If I was able to, 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 to get to PMA. But I could not understand that. But then again, if you are in the military, you will understand why they have to go through these things. Because it will help toughen them. It will help strengthen them. It will give them stamina. It will give them uh, agility. It will uh, allow them to endure hardness. Because that is what you're going to experience in times of war. So they are allowed or these things are designed that they go through this so that they will become a better person fitted for the, for the job of a soldier. And the same thing with us. God designed all of this suffering in order to strengthen our faith. So that whatever we may experience in life, listen, it will work together for our good. We'll be able to bear them. Okay, what are the purpose of suffering? Number one, to prove the reality of our faith. Look at 1 Peter 1.7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, that perish it, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why they try gold with fire? To know if it is really gold. To know its purity and to refine the gold. And if you put your faith in Jesus, our faith will be tried to know if it is really a genuine faith. Because a fake faith will not be able to endure fire. It will not be refined, but it will be burned out. It will be consumed. It will turn into uh, ashes. And it's not going to endure forever. So, trials and sufferings are allowed by God in order for us to know if our faith is a real faith. Not for God to know because God knows everything. But God is helping us to know if we really have faith. Because there are people who can deceive themselves. They believe that they are Christians but in the end they will die. They will go to hell. Why? Because their faith cannot endure in the face of trials and temptations. So God is allowing this so that we will understand if our faith is a genuine faith. Look at Genesis 22.1. Does Abraham believe God? Do you believe that Abraham has had faith in God? Well, God has to try it. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And what follows is the offering of Isaac to God. The only son of Abraham. And because Abraham has genuine faith, he did not even stagger at the command of God and he willingly offered Isaac to God. But God says, I have proven. And now you know that you have a genuine faith and because of that, Abraham became the father of faith. But if that faith was not tested or tried, how can he become the father of faith? Look at Job chapter 13, verse number 15. We know the story. Job was a melty man. He had a good family. And then all of a sudden, tragedy happened to his life. A tragedy that almost uh, does not stop. It is a series of, of unfortunate incidents that first the family died except the wife uh, no the, the, the wealth were taken away and then the family died except the wife and then the wife even uh, encouraged him to curse God so that he will die and then the health was taken away and then friends were taken away and look what Job says though he slay me yet will I trust in him but I will maintain my own ways before him you see, even if all these things were allowed by God to happen to Job, Job still trusted the Lord. To the point that Job said, even if God will kill me, I will still trust in Him. And what happened in the latter life of Job? Everything was doubled by 
God, again, accept the wife. Because we must only have one wife. Amen? Sabi ng iba, sayang. It should have been better if God doubled the wife of Job. No, one is enough. Two is too much. Amen? And that is something that is hard to handle. Because having one wife is already a handful. Right? Because you already have two in-laws. So having two wives means four in-laws and you will die crazy because of them. So to prove the reality of our faith, number two, to strengthen our faith. So the only way for our faith to be strong is for our faith to be tested. You see, you see this muscle? He said, where? This muscle. Okay, how about this muscle? What? You're, you have a suspicious mind. Ah, yeah, okay, so we're the same. In order for this muscle to be strengthened, it must be exercised. It must be tested. It must be put into practice. Now, I'm having a lot of problem with my muscle. I cannot even lift my hands up because of overuse. So, Pastor, is it wrong to overuse your faith? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about muscle. But I'm just comparing faith to our muscle. In order for it to grow, it must be put into test. Why? Because we have different degrees of faith. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse number 40. Some people are like this. Mark 4, 40. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? You see, some people have no faith. They will die. They will go to hell because they have no faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that. And then let's look at Matthew 16, 8. Matthew 16, 8. So from no faith, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. So from no faith, you can have faith. But your faith may be little, and if your faith is little, then it can only accomplish little. Because it is just a little faith. Look at uh, chapter 15, verse 28 of Matthew. 15, 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. So from no faith, some people have little faith, but some people have great faith. He said, a woman. And it was said to a woman. Ajong, maybe this is the reason why. They know more than us. O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole, uh, made whole from that very hour. You see, listen to me. If our faith is growing, and we graduated into what we call great faith, we can have what we desire. Do you know why? Because people with great faith will only desire the will of God. And because you desire God's will, it will happen to you. Great faith. So how can this faith become great? Exercise. Testing. Applying our faith in our lives. Look at Matthew 8.10. Great faith. And then look at my J10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. So it is not just great faith, but so great faith. Like for example, for God so loved the world. Not only that God loved the world, he so loved the world. Not only that we can have great faith, but so great faith. If we will allow testings to come and try our faith. And what will be the result? Look at Acts chapter 6 verse number 5. Now God can use us in saying, and, this, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. And of the Holy Ghost. Why? If you have so great a faith, you will be filled with faith. And if you are full of faith, then God will choose you to do something to glorify Him. Amen? 
The reason why God is not choosing some Christians is because they do not have enough faith that will cause the name of God to be glorified in the things that we are doing for Him. That is the reason why we need our we need to exercise our faith so that it will become a what? This kind of faith. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. What is the faith of Abraham? Not weak, therefore it is what we call a strong faith. And when you have a strong faith, you believe that nothing is impossible with God. How old was Abraham here? 100. How old was Sarah? 99. And they still have no child. But God says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Just imagine what kind of faith a hundred year old man will need to still believe that they can conceive with a 99 year old woman. Brother Bob, imagine that. When you're 100 years old, you can barely stand up. You can barely work your way. You can barely do strenuous things. But from 75 years old, when Abraham was promised, he did, snap, he did not stop trying for 25 years. Brother June, Sister Chona, Keep believing. Keep trying. Keep on keeping on. Amen? And in God's time, according to His will and your faith, it will happen. Amen? Time will come that Pema will have a brother or a sister in the household. Amen? It will happen. Why? Because nothing is impossible to a person that has strong faith in God. Amen? So number one, to prove the reality of our faith. Number two, to strengthen our faith. Number three, to discipline and educate us. God is using suffering so that He can teach us things that we will never learn except from suffering. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 7. 12, 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So, when we are chastened, we will learn that we did something wrong. And we are going to stop doing that. Look at Hebrews 5, 8. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. How did he learn obedience? Because of the things that he suffered. So suffering is a tool of God in order to educate each and every one of us. Number four, to humble us. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 9. Suffering is a great tool in humbling a person or a child of God, especially those people who may be accomplishing something for the Lord. It is not expedient for me Doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such an, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Look at what Paul experienced. He went up to paradise and he saw things and, and heard words that he cannot even utter. He's not allowed to do that. How that he was caught up into... Okay, next verse. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. You see, God revealed so many things to Paul 
there was given to me a thorn in the flesh that is his suffering there was a thorn in the flesh the messenger of satan to buffet me lest i should be exalted above measure you see because of all the knowledge that paul has because of all the revelations of god there is a tendency to be steaming yourself higher than other people look for example if i know more than all of you i can say that well uh, i'm better than all of you there is there is the temptation in in the apostle paul but he said i'm going to be foolish if i will do that and god helped me not to do it because he sent a thorn in the flesh and he even used satan to put the thorn in the flesh in me look at verse number eight for this thing i besought the lord thrice that it might depart from me and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness that is his suffering weakness in the flesh he said my for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will i rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me you see suffering will happen and god will allow it so that it will keep our feet on the ground because we have the tendency to blow our ego out of proportion when good things are happening and when we are accomplishing things in life that's why there are so many people standing behind the pulpit who should be humble but they are boastful why because of the many revelations because of the many blessings that are coming their way and when they look at all of these blessings and all of the uh, uh, the things that god has given them they say i am great and because of my greatness look at all of these things ladies and gentlemen god will see to it and will remind us that he will send suffering so that you will understand it is all by god not by you Amen. nobody can claim the glory except God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 2 and 3. 8, 2 and 3. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. You see, it was mentioned a while ago. Egypt to, to Canaan will take only 11 days to travel in a straight path. But it took them how long? 40 years years there is a purpose if they went through for 11 days and they were able to conquer canaan after 11 days it will ruin them but god saw to it that they are going to go around the wilderness for 40 years in order to learn a lesson that is why listen to me one of the most intellectual people in the world are the Israelites or the Jewish people when it comes to technology how can you grow the giant of fruits in the wilderness they can do that they are genius when it comes to technology and all of these things but when it comes to spiritual things they're the most stupid people in the world it took God 40 years to teach them that they need to be humble if they will become successful in serving the Lord. 40 years! And God saw to it that they will go around the wilderness for 40 years and the purpose is wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And we saw during our Sunday school that they have not kept the commandment of God for from the time of Joshua until the time of Nehemiah and that is hundreds of years look at verse number 3 and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord that man live so god allows suffering in order to humble us number five to purify us we're almost finished don't worry uh, your suffering will end <laughs> amen it will end i promise you the suffering will end to purify us first peter 1 7 again 
tried by fire. Our faith, when being tried, are becoming purified. You need to understand that. Purification can only happen when there is what we call trial by fire. So, when we go through suffering, our faith are being purified. Look at 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Before we go to the uh, penultimate part of the uh, section. For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin. You see, when we are suffering, it is helping us to stop sinning. Because we do not like, we may not like that kind of suffering, so it will teach us to flee from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the loss of men, but to the will of God. So it purifies our faith. Number six, to qualify us to help others. This is one of the greatest ministry of suffering. Second, Pete, Second Corinthians 1, 3 to 7. We will just read this. Second Corinthians 1, 3 to 7. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Look at the next verse. Who comforted us in all our tribulation. So we have tribulation, we are comforted. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. The next for as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. And verse number 6 and 7, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And verse 7, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Meaning to say, why do we suffer? So that we can help those who will suffer. Because how can we help them if we were not first the recipient of help when we are in times of trials and temptation? So that is the ministry of suffering. Sometimes you say, for no apparent reason there is because some people will go through that and you will help them go through that phase of suffering in their lives that's why it is allowed by god so that we can help others to qualify us to be a help to other people and number seven to prove to us the sufficiency of the grace of god philippians 1 23 For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul experienced so much suffering in life. But he says, God told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. When there is so much suffering, there is only one person to run to. And that is God. And when you run to God, He will uh, make sure that you will see that he has grace that is sufficient for all the sufferings that you are going to experience in life. So that's the end of that section and we're almost finished. The spirits of sufferings and trials are varied. Look at verse number 6. Look at the word manifold. Through manifold temptations. The suffering that we will experience will be diverse. It can be physical, it can be mental, it can be spiritual, or it can be emotional. So, all these kinds of suffering will be allowed by God in order to prepare us holistically for the ministry that He wants us to minister to other people. Our pride will be tested. You see, some Christians suffer and are tested by poverty. When there is not no food on the table, we are tested. And some people are tested by prosperity. When they become prosperous, you cannot reach them anymore. It is as if they are, out of, uh, out of this world, better than other people. Some Christians suffer and tested by a lower position. And they cannot bear it. They want to, 
be promoted. And some people are being tested when given a heavy dose of responsibility in high places. And because of that, instead of becoming humble, they will become boastful and seize the power in order to control other people. But listen to me, all of this will come to us so that if we will trust the Lord in all of these things, then we'll be able to help those people that may be in the lower rank in life going up and how to be humble when they are up there. These periods of sufferings and trials are sometimes very severe. Sometimes, though God says light affliction easy, there will be times that it will be tried with fire. And sometimes it's going to be severe. But memorize this verse. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No matter how severe it is. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is, you remember that, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. You're able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. If God send it, then we can bear it. So always remember that. And then, these trials and sufferings that we experience are all related to the future. We experience them now in order for us to benefit in the future. Look at the... Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17 Four more verses and we will end. For 2 Corinthians 4.17, look at this. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more excellent eternal weight of glory. So, our suffering is in view with our eternity. So, we are being prepared in order to enjoy the blessings of God. John 13.7 Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So, sometimes we do not understand why God is doing all of these things. But time will come, we will understand. Look at James 1.12. This is a very good verse. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. The only way for us to receive the crown of life is to endure trials and temptations. So without suffering, there will be no reward. You understand that? So it is designed by God so that we can enjoy eternity, which the Lord that promised to them that love Him. And then lastly, the secret victory, the secret to victory in suffering is to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. When you are suffering, don't look at the suffering. It will bear you down. But when you're suffering, look at the Lord Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Why? He authored our faith. There may be sufferings along the way, but He will finish our faith. He who had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. When you are suffering, you are being one with God. Focus on that. And when we focus on that, we can see that all of these things will be able to bear. And we will understand that suffering is not a mystery after all, but it is a ministry given to each and every child of God. Amen? Shall we stand up? Every head's bowed. Every head's bowed, please. Suffering is a word that connotes negative things. And so many people would rather not experience sufferings in life. But if you are a child of God, it is given unto us not only to believe, but to suffer. Because we need to understand the life of the Lord Jesus Christ.